Is it better to dream, or is it better to create? When Terry Gilliam released the completed version of his long-delayed and legendarily disaster-ridden Cervantes adaptation, The Man Who Killed Don Quixote, in 2018, the movie was not quite what anyone expected. Instead of the luminous, easily embraced masterpiece people had built up in their heads, here was a film scarred by legal skirmishes and budgetary limitations that issued a challenging, perhaps career-redefining statement from a great cinematic fantasist. The deeply ambivalent reactions from both viewers and Gilliam himself are worthy of analysis. It is easy, too easy, to embellish a non-existent or incomplete film. It's sometimes difficult to appreciate something once it exists in final form, with all its compromises and imperfections. But compromise and imperfection are intrinsically part of the process of artistic creation. Our failure to recognize this, and our attempts to ignore it, are more harmful than we realize. It distances our relationship to art and the people who make it. When we demand perfection, we turn art into a product, existing only to satisfy consumer demands. Art is more than that. It is difficult, it is imperfect, and it is human. It can also be painful, and sometimes even a victory can hurt. Terry Gilliam first read Don Quixote in the late 80s or early 90s. When it came into his life, his career was at a very vulnerable crossroads. He had just directed a massive flop, The Adventures of Baron Munchausen, an enchanting fantasy that had gone gravely over budget, only to be essentially tossed aside by its distributor, which left the future of Gilliam's career in dire jeopardy. By then, Gilliam had established himself as an iconoclast, openly opposed to the business side of movie production. He publicly battled Universal Studios over the final cut of his satirical sci-fi masterpiece, Brazil. He'd gotten funding from George Harrison under the Handmade Films banner for his unconventional fantasy adventure, Time Bandits, which was a sleeper hit. He'd even seemed to rebel against the comedy troupe that made him famous, Monty Python, when he released his solo directing debut, Jabberwocky, in 1977, a medieval comedy that was like a darker and less accessible version of Monty Python and the Holy Grail, which Gilliam had co-directed with Terry Jones. Going all the way back to his beginnings as a cartoonist and animator, Gilliam adopted his initial career path partially as a way of sidestepping the traditional roots to filmmaking. Speaking of his early years to Bob McCabe for the book Dark Knights and Holy Fools, Gilliam says he already knew he wanted to make films, but didn't know how. The idea of working through the business was unacceptable to him, and he refused to do work he was not passionate about. Becoming an animator was a way of making do with the knowledge and skill set he already possessed, something he translated to filmic terms when he finally found his way behind the camera on a live-action project. Being a director of strong convictions and big ideas, all of his films were conscious efforts to thumb his nose at convention and create large-scale, thematically rich fantasy backed by imagination and ingenuity rather than studio resources. He worked hard to tailor his visions to low budgets and limited means, creating imagery of such originality and impact it transcended its impoverished origins. 
Munchausen was the first time one of those visions had gotten out of control. Its reputation as a runaway disaster, led by some megalomaniacal madman, was a serious blow to him. Its subsequent and very public failure threw him perilously off course. Gilliam had run into a wall. He could no longer move forward as an independent. The only option was to swallow his pride and try working at the studio level to rebuild his credibility. It was just a matter of finding a story good enough to convince a studio to hire him. Among the projects he attempted to organize during this transition was the very first iteration of Quixote. Don Quixote was written by Miguel de Cervantes and published in two parts in the early 17th century. Today, it is considered among the foundational works of modern Western literature. Its story is of an idle Spanish noble who, after going insane reading countless romantic stories of chivalry, adopts the persona of a knight and bumbles his way through a series of misadventures with his sidekick and squire, Sancho Panza. Cervantes pokes fun at medieval conventions and ideas of chivalry throughout the novel's vast length, while his enormous complexities in tone, developing the story from comedy to tragedy, have led to many seeing its hero as an archetype, embodying the purity of the dreamer, cheerfully pitting romantic delusion against the harshness of reality. Over the centuries, the character became so famous that this latter interpretation tended to become the standard, while the book itself remains a much more ambiguous creation. Don Quixote has inspired possibly hundreds of homages, parodies, and adaptations in the form of books, plays, musicals, and movies. Screen versions of Quixote go all the way back to the silent era, Orson Welles attempted a production of his own in the late 50s and early 60s that was famously left unfinished. Welles's Quixote was released posthumously in 1992, assembled from available footage in a compromised edit that was not well received. Gilliam's original concept for his Quixote, as described in Dark Knights and Holy Fools, sounds like it would have been a fairly faithful, straightforward adaptation. It started when he contacted producer Jake Eberts to pitch the idea, and after getting the go-ahead, sat down with Charles McEwen to write a script. The book, as Gilliam puts it, overwhelmed him, and he struggled to find a way to adapt it. The project moved far enough along that location scouting began in Spain, with Gilliam looking at many of the same locations used for Ridley Scott's 1492. According to an article Gilliam published in Neon Magazine in 1997, the film wasn't gaining enough traction in Hollywood, so he turned to Europe for financing, looking to raise a $20 million budget. He was thinking Nigel Hawthorne could play Quixote, and Danny DeVito might play Sancho. His financiers wanted Sean Connery for Quixote. The budget started rising, and Gilliam had to leave the production, switching his focus to The Defective Detective, his second longest gestating pet project, and one I'll probably return to in a future episode. Neither project gained steam, and Gilliam eventually made his Hollywood debut with a great film that, surprisingly, did not originate from his own material, The Fisher King, in 1991. A long string of frustratingly fruitless development deals followed, including adaptations of A Scanner Darkly, A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, A Tale of Two Cities, and The Hunchback of Notre Dame, before another pre-existing script, Twelve Monkeys, finally came his way in 1995. Meanwhile, his Quixote production actually tried to move forward without him. Production company Phoenix Pictures controlled the rights for a time, and they hired director Fred Schapese to take it over. John Cleese and Robin Williams were considered to star. By 1997, the film was cancelled, 
with the budget, according to Variety, eventually reaching over $60 million. Gilliam grew fed up with Hollywood, forever fearful of financing his personal projects and original ideas, despite the fact that he had given them two back-to-back -back hits, and decided to return to alternate forms of financing. Realizing he regretted the decision to abandon Quixote, saying at one point, it was the project he was convinced he was the best director to do. He managed to reacquire the rights after Phoenix's production folded, and resumed work on it with screenwriter Tony Grissoni, his co-writer on what turned out to be a polarizing screen adaptation of Hunter S. Thompson's Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Their rewrite altered the concept for the film drastically. Instead of a straight adaptation, the story would now follow a 21st century marketing executive named Toby, who is thrown back in time and winds up meeting the real Don Quixote, who mistakes him for Sancho Panza. Gilliam worked on this new version from about 1998 into the early new millennium. The film, now retitled The Man Who Killed Don Quixote, started gearing up for production around September of 2000. As most of us already know, an ominous cloud was hanging over Gilliam, preparing a swift descent.